indeed we want the Lord to shape us and mold us and use us how he sees fit. If he is Lord of our life, he is in control of our life, he can do with us as he sees fit. Amen. If you have your Bible, I invite you to open it to the Gospel of Luke, the seventh chapter. Gospel of Luke, the seventh chapter, beginning at verse 11. I'm reading how it happened the day after that he went into a city called Nain. Many of his disciples went with him and a large crowd. When he came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a large crowd from the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, do not weep. Keep reading with me. Then he came and touched the open coffin, and those who carried him stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. So he who was dead sat up and began to speak. And he presented him to his mother. Then fear came upon all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen up among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him went throughout all Judea and all the surrounding region. Today, the Lord has a message for us entitled, Going in Opposite Directions. Going in Opposite Directions. Please bow your heads with me as we begin the message today. Spirit of the living God, we ask that you might be our teacher today. As we have read from your holy word, we ask now that the spirit of truth that inspired the gospel writer to pen these words, that that same Holy Spirit might open our hearts and minds to understand what you have for us today. But more than that, Lord, we ask that you might use your word through your spirit to transform your people to be more like you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. The story is told of some seminary students, not at Andrews, amen, uh, some seminary students that were in Greek class and they were given an assignment to read from the Greek text, I think it's Luke 15, the story of the Good Samaritan, and to translate it from Greek into English, and then they were to write a paper on that assignment. You know the story of the Good Samaritan. The, uh, the person was walking down that road to Jericho and was jumped, mugged, and the, uh, the priests and lawyer, the religious leaders, came by, saw him, left him for dead, passed by him on the other side, and then, uh, then the Samaritan sees him. Samaritans don't associate with uh, the Jews. They see him, the man sees him, but rather than follow the lead of the priests and the lawyer, and uh, rather than follow their bad example, he passes and sees the man and stops and helps him, cleans his wounds as best he can, and then takes him to an inn and pays the man to further care for him and provide whatever he needed until he should return. And if it was more than what he had, he said, when I come back, I'll give you uh, whatever I owe you. The students translated. Uh, they were trained in Greek and, and, and in the foreign languages. They translated the story. They, they, they parsed and analyzed and exegeted the passage. They, they did all of that and wrote very excellent papers on the topic. Well, two students decided to, uh, to go beyond that. They wanted to see 
uh, with all of this seminary training, if, the, uh, if their classmates, uh, how they would respond if they should come across someone in similar circumstances. And so two seminary students uh, had, with the aid of some of the, uh, the ones who do makeup and all of that stuff, they, they decorated and dressed like they were homeless and that they were beaten and bruised. They had bruises painted on them and blood painted on them and they, they looked as if they had been mugged and, and that they were homeless individuals. They dressed like that and they were in the, the area in the seminary, near the seminary, and their classmates came and walked by and just like the story that they had just translated, and analyzed, they saw the individuals there and walked right by them. The classmates concluded that while an understanding of the languages and an understanding of the text and being able to analyze and being able to exegete and being able to parse, all of that is significant and important, but the most important thing is actually internalizing the word and using it for the benefit of someone in need. Too often, we might understand what the Bible is saying but don't do what the Bible is saying. God isn't looking for Christians who can analyze all of the prophecies and all of the texts so that we will have accurate message to disseminate to the world. No, God is looking for people who accurately reflect the character of Jesus Christ. Can I get a witness on that point? The Bible tells us Jesus has just finished teaching, and every time Jesus stood up to teach, there was always a crowd. In fact, even when he was in a house teaching where there wasn't even much room, the place was packed wall to wall. Jesus has just finished teaching and preaching the gospel, the good news of the kingdom, and a crowd is following him. He is descending from the, 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 the uh, mountaintop down into the valley, leaving from Capernaum en route down to southern Palestine. Jesus has his disciples right behind him and an entourage of loyal followers waiting to see or hear something from Jesus. Jesus. Everywhere Jesus traveled, there was always a crowd. Jesus is leaving the lush and beautiful seaside city of Capernaum, and he is traveling down in the valley, and, and he is traveling up another mountainside toward the city of Maine. Now, modern-day Nain, I'm told, is a beautiful city, a bustling city, but in the time of Jesus, it was an empty city. It was a rocky city, nothing beautiful about it, nothing substantial about it. It wasn't a large city. There wasn't a whole lot of people in that town. It wasn't significant of a place. There wasn't great prophets and preachers or singers. There wasn't much that came from Nain. And as Jesus is ascending up the mountain toward this mountain city of Nain, Jesus has a crowd following him, and Jesus looks in the distance and sees another crowd going from the city he is going to. Do you get that picture? In Jesus' crowd, they're singing Jesus' praises. In Jesus' crowd, they're shouting for joy. They've seen Jesus do miracles. They're excited because of this great teacher. They've watched Jesus cast out demons. In his crowd, there's excitement and enthusiasm. There's noise, but it's the noise of praise and adoration and thanksgiving. But just in the distance, they hear other noise. It isn't the noise of praying the noise of weeping. In his crowd, there is joy. In the crowd in front of him, there is sadness. The Bible says that descending 
that mountainside city of Maine is a crowd led by a woman who has just lost her son. She leads the procession according to Jewish tradition. Then the pallbearers carrying the open coffin, the open casket uh, uh, of her son, followed by a large crowd of individuals who have come to weep and mourn with her. Now, the very fact that the city is small and yet her crowd is large seems to indicate that she was fairly well-known and well-loved in her community. It might have been a small city, but everybody knew her and everybody they loved her. And as she and the crowd descends, Jesus and his crowd ascends up the mountain. What a scene. Two crowds approaching each other, going in opposite directions, totally different sounds, totally different feeling, totally different mood, but they're about to connect on that mountainside. The Bible tells us when Jesus sees the crowd, the first thing he does, he goes to the mother and he has compassion on her and says, do not weep. First thing I want us to notice about Jesus is Jesus expresses unnecessary compassion. Did you get that? Unnecessary compassion towards the mother. Why is it unnecessary? Well, Jesus isn't from Nain. Jesus, for all we can tell, doesn't even know the woman. Jesus doesn't know the boy who's died. Jesus was not invited to the funeral. Jesus has no connection to what's going on. In fact, Jesus has a crowd of people following him and praising him. He has other business to attend to. And yet, as soon as he sees the sadness on his face, he stops what he's doing and pays attention to the woman who is grieving. There's no reason for him to show her any kindness. He doesn't know her. He has no ties to her. Yet he sees it necessary to stop and show compassion. I think the example of Jesus is an example that we too ought to follow. Jesus isn't looking for individuals who are nice only to those who are nice to them. Jesus needs followers who are willing to go out of their way to be kind even to people they do not know and do not care about them. In fact, the religion of Christ is a religion that is kind to those who are our enemies, the Bible says. That is a characteristic of a follower of Jesus Christ. I remember some years ago, I was, I was on my way to church, and as I was driving to church, I saw individuals I didn't know, on the side of the road, who needed some assistance. Uh, now, I don't know much about cars, but I could tell by the way that they were working on their tire that they must have known less than me. There's no way they would have been successful in changing their tire based on what they were currently doing. And I felt moved that I should stop and help. Anybody ever felt, uh, God didn't necessarily speak a word verbally, but you felt in your spirit you should go and say something to someone to encourage them or go and help someone who needed help. Have you ever felt that down in your spirit and, and you knew that it was God telling you, this is what you ought to do? Listen, it's not, you know, everybody doesn't get the same command. God speaks to everyone individually, and what he has for you to do may not be what he has for me to do, but if God talks to you and says, listen, you need to go beside that person and give them a hug, that's what God has for you to do. Boy, I felt it in my heart. I needed to stop. And like many of us, I made excuse after excuse. Well, Lord, I, I can't stop because I have something so important to do. I have to speak today at church. And the Lord reminded me, before I call you to speak on behalf of me, you ought to live on behalf of me. 
But Lord, I'm dressed in, in, in wonderful clothing. I don't want to get my stuff dirty. Come on, somebody. I don't have that many suits as is. Something happened to the one I'm wearing. I, I'm, it'd be down to two. <laughs> and I'm reminded that Jesus said, uh, look at the lilies of the field. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Look how beautifully they are uh, 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 adorned. The birds don't worry about their food. The, 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 the fields don't worry about their... Uh, uh, God provides for his, his creation. How much more will God provide for us? And you're worried about your clothing. God is looking for individuals who are compassionate and it's not necessary, it's not an obligation, it's not a command. You're compassionate solely because you are a child of Jesus. The Bible says Jesus stops his procession so that he can respond to the saddened mother. Now, I, I, as I was reading the text, I, I, I had to ask, I asked myself many times, why in the world would Jesus go up to the mother and say, do not weep? There's a couple of things that, that concern me there. First of all, Jesus was about to raise her son back to life. Why in the world waste the time saying, do not weep? when you know that in just a few moments, she won't be weeping anyway. But I, I, I felt, and I could be wrong, but as I read the text, I, uh, I, the, the language of the text seems to indicate that Jesus was so moved by what he had seen in the face of the mother that Jesus had to go to her first before doing anything else, and he had to touch her physically and provide comfort to her. That's the kind of Savior that we have. It's not just about doing what, is, uh, what you're going to do, but it's about how you do it. It's not enough that I just give you a handout when you say, Pastor, I need some money. No, I come and say, Brother, how you doing today? I give you a hug and a handshake. Those little things matter, not because they're required. It's just because you have the heart of the master. Jesus sees a woman who is in pain, who is in sorrow, and he goes up to her and he says, don't weep. It's going to be okay. How often have we seen someone who looks down? Maybe we're so busy in church or getting to church or having church, doing church, that someone is down. And we don't even take the time to come beside them to understand what's going on. I remember one time, somebody said, you know, as we always do, happy Sabbath, happy Sabbath. How you doing today? And you expect to hear the response, something like, oh, I'm doing great. I'm blessed. Hallelujah, praise the Lord, because that's the fakeness that we portray at church. Am I right? Yeah, I know somebody, somebody said, how are you doing? I'm doing horrible. And the person said, well, praise the Lord. And they kept going because they weren't even listening. Am I right? Sometimes we're so busy and caught up in what we're doing that we do not take the time to stop and actually have compassion. The heart of Jesus was so sensitive to the needs of others that regardless of what he was doing, he stopped when he saw someone in pain. The second thing we see here in this story, Jesus, first of all, was unnecessarily compassionate. He didn't know her. In fact, she didn't even ask for his help. Nowhere in the text does it say she motioned for Jesus to come near her. She didn't even ask him to raise her son back to life. She never asked for anything. Jesus was unnecessarily compassionate towards her. But the second thing we see that Jesus was, Jesus get this, he was intentionally radical. You say, well, pastor, where do you see that? Well, let me show you. The Bible says after he comes up and talks to the mother, remember the mother leads the crowd, the next group that is there 
is the pallbearer. Am I right? Now understand that for the Jewish funeral, the way it worked was you would have the, the uh, you you would have a service, but you didn't do it inside the city limits because you would always bury outside the city. They didn't have the kind of burials and vaults and all the rest of that. And so when you have a dead body, you don't want bodies being buried uh, and and rotting close to you. You know people and the city, city waters, all this kind of stuff. And so they would carry the body out the city on the shoulders of these pallbearers. Uh, it wasn't like, you know, carrying a body from here to a vehicle right there. Are you with me? Uh, they had to carry uh, uh, the body from wherever the person died. They put them on this bed and carried the body, usually a good 15 to 20 miles outside the city. So they had teams of people who carried because it was against their tradition to let that body touch the ground. So they had to carry, and then they would alternate, rotate. They had teams of people who carried, and they never were supposed to stop. Now, get this, get this. They're right behind the mother. You could imagine, you could imagine that they're tired, right? They're carrying this body. They're tired. They don't stop. Jesus has to get their attention in order to stop it long enough so he can raise the boy back to life. And what does Jesus do? Does the Bible say Jesus says to them, stop? Does it say that? Now that would make sense to me. One, because I'm not particularly fond of touching dead bodies. I would stand back and say, stop! And then I would say, hey man, wake up! And I would go nowhere near. But the Bible says Jesus doesn't call out. The Bible says Jesus goes up and touches the coffin. Now, if you know something about Jewish ceremonial laws, you know that Jesus was making himself ceremonially unclean, doing that which he was not supposed to do in order to raise the boy back to life. Why do I say intentionally radical? Jesus knew exactly what he was doing, and he chose to do it anyway because he was trying to make a point. And if you miss that Jesus was making a point, let me show you. Jesus loved to make a point by breaking the ceremonial laws and breaking their traditions. How do I know? Go back to... Go back just a couple chapters in Luke. Go back to chapter 6. Go to Luke chapter 6. You read in that very beginning of the chapter, it happened on the second Sabbath after the first that he went through the grain fields and his disciples plucked the heads of grain and ate them, rubbing them in their hands. And some of the Pharisees said to them, why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? Jesus then responded, haven't you read this, what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him, how he went into the house of God, took and ate the showbread and also gave some to those with him, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. Then he said, the son of man is Lord of the Sabbath. In other versions of the story, he says the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the son of man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Understand, Jesus intentionally broke their traditions in their face so that he could make the point that man is more important in the eyes of God than the ceremonies. Did you get that? Man is more important in the eyes of God than the traditions. Traditions aren't bad. God is the one who instituted tradition. God is the one who instituted the ceremonial laws, and yet Jesus is here in our text going against his own instituted ceremonial law and some of the traditions that have been established just to make the point that it is not about those traditions and ceremonies. It is first about people. Listen, you can have all of the right understanding in your mind of what Scripture says, but if you don't have the value that God has, then you're not a true disciple of Jesus Christ. Jesus wasn't just, a, yes, Jesus kept the Sabbath, yes, Jesus followed the law, and yet Jesus valued more importantly people and helping and serving others and caring for others than he did the very ceremonies that he instituted. 
Jesus was trying to teach a lesson. And only if God's people would catch that lesson, how many more would be won into the kingdom of God than are currently won if we would realize that people take priority in the heart and mind of Jesus Christ. I know for some of us, we wouldn't stop when we see someone on the side of the road because we'd say, well, it's the Sabbath. Am I right? It's the Sabbath. Yet Jesus made the point, wouldn't you pull your ox out of a ditch if he was trapped on the Sabbath? Jesus made that point to say that people are more important even than some of the things that you think are in line with Sabbath keeping. Sabbath is about people. It's not first about rules. Jesus is always about people first. Later in chapter 6 of Luke, the Bible says Jesus is in the temple teaching on the Sabbath. And a man is in church who's, who has a withered hand. And then Jesus does something, I, I don't know that I could ever do this because I don't like putting people on the spot, you know. But Jesus calls the man who's injured, calls him up front, says, stand right here. And then he says to the church, now, knowing how they think about the Sabbath, says to the church, uh, you tell me, is it lawful for me to do good on the Sabbath or to do evil? To heal and restore him or to leave him like he is? Nobody dared open their mouth, although Jesus knew what all of them were thinking. Jesus knew that they would rather allow the man to suffer in pain. He wasn't going to die. His hand is where that he's not dying. But he, th they would rather him suffer in pain because it's the Sabbath than to help the brother out, which is what the Sabbath is supposed to be about. Jesus was intentionally radical. It was more important for him to help the mother and raise the son than it was to worry about ceremonially unclean. Did you get that? So the Bible says Jesus stops the procession. He first goes up to the mother and shows compassion unnecessarily. Then he stops the pallbearers by touching the casket. Just a side note, something to think about. Did the woman exhibit any faith that Jesus could raise her son back to life? Did the boy who was dead exhibit any faith that Jesus could raise him back to life? Did anyone in the story ever get any commendation that they had any faith whatsoever in Jesus? And yet Jesus raised them anyway. Sometimes we box God into the, 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 as if God has to act in certain ways based on us, and we forget that the Bible teaches that God is sovereign. In other words, God allows the sun to shine on the wicked and the righteous. He is not dependent on us only in order to do what he chooses to do. God sometimes heals even individuals who have no faith, who do not ask and who will not follow him after he does it. And some of us who have faith, God chooses not to heal. God is sovereign, and we cannot box God in as if he has to act based on how we think he's going to act. God does whatever God wants to do. I know some of us, we don't like that. I'm glad God does whatever he wants to do because I, just like the rest of us, are fickle. Am I right? Uh, one day you're up, the next day you're down. One day you're happy with God, next day you're mad. Just like little children, all of us. I know sometimes children, uh, my children do the same thing, and I know your children do the same thing. Some days come, oh, daddy, you're the greatest daddy on the planet. Next day, daddy, you're so mean. If you respond based on how children act and give them what they ask, well, you'd be in a world of trouble. 
God knows how we are. God doesn't just respond just on how we act because God knows one day we're up, next day we have no faith. We've lost all faith. We don't believe God can do anything. We're worried, how am I going to make the rent payment? How am I going to pay my mortgage? Even though last week we stood up and testified how the Lord sent us a check in the mail unexpectedly and paid for our light bill, but now it's the rent. We believed last week, but this week we doubt. Jesus is not dependent only on our faith. Yes, Jesus honors faith, but Jesus works beyond just the faith of people. God is sovereign. God can heal whomever he chooses to heal, and he can choose not to heal if he chooses not to. Jesus was unnecessarily compassionate. Jesus was intentionally radical. Because Jesus understands that people are more important even than many of the traditions and policies and ceremonies that we might think are important. Later in the chapter, come with me back to chapter 7. As I was studying for this message, I ran across a text that I just have to read because I find it humorous. And then I'm going to start to close down this, this message today. Chapter 7, when you skip down with me, verse 29 and on. When all the people heard him, even the tax collectors, justified God, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. The Lord said, to what then will I liken the men of this generation? What are they like? They are like children. See, the Bible says it. they're like children. <laughs> they're like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another saying, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We mourned to you and you did not weep. John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine and you say he has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look, he's a glutton and a wine-bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. In other words, what Jesus was saying was that this generation would, 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 would complain whether Jesus did what he said they should do, or if Jesus went against what they said he should do. No matter what Jesus did, they were going to complain. So Jesus said, I'm not going to follow solely what you think I should do. I'm going to place priority on people and not on your systems of, of ceremonies and, and your values. I'm going to value people above all else. God is looking for people who care genuinely about people. That people, other than giving honor and glory to God in your life, being obedient to him, that people take priority in your life. Not jobs, not money, not traditions, not the way we used to do it. But that people are a priority. But I will skip over all of them and I'll tell this story. The story is told of a young man who was coming home from Vietnam War. And when he came home from the Vietnam War, he landed in California, and he called his folks back in Boston. That's how they say it in Boston. 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 He called his folks back in Boston. And he told his parents he, he had landed safely, and he was coming home. Holidays. And his parents were excited that they were coming home. And he said, well, is it okay if I bring someone with me? I said, sure. It's fine. Well, well, well I, I, I didn't say that, um, but the, uh, the person I want to bring is, they, they unfortunately lost a leg in the war. And they lost an arm in the war. And they had an eye shot out in the war. Can I bring them home with me for the holidays? 
Well, his mother was on the phone and said, well, son, yeah, you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, what, you know, what will the people think, you know, this guy and so forth? He kind of looked strange and, so, and, and, and had some concern, and then the phone hung up. A couple days later, his parents got a phone call and was told that their son had committed suicide. Their son had lost his leg and his arm and his eye in the war. And because his parents seemed to think that it would be embarrassing to have such a one in their household, the boy committed suicide. How many people are lost from the kingdom of God way too early? because they don't dress the way we think they should dress. People are more important than clothing. And I can guarantee you this, not one person is going to lose out on the kingdom because they dress the way they dress. I can guarantee you that. Because salvation is never based on dress. And yet so many get driven away because they dress a certain way and don't look the part. How many people have come to me and said, Pastor, I want to come to church, but I don't have the right clothes to wear? In fact, I know someone who came to me who left church Sabbath morning because they said, and it was 11 o'clock, they left church and said, Pastor, I, gotta, I, have, I, I can't come in the way I'm dressed. And I thought, you can't, you can't come to worship God because you have on a pair of jeans. And I mean, now if you're naked, that's different. I can understand. By all means, please go home, change your clothes, put on some clothes. Please. I don't want to see it. But it does no harm to the worship of Jesus Christ if someone is in here and they don't have on a suit and tie. I guarantee you, it does no harm to the worship of God. In fact, that tradition has nothing to do with what the Bible commands. Did you hear me? It has nothing to do with what the Bible commands. It is a part of our tradition, and I have no problem with it, but it has nothing to do with what God commands. And yet so many people are more concerned with our tradition and how we do it than with the people. I've told this before. I'm not going to do it, but I'm going to share the story. I had a friend of mine who, as a pastor, he said to his church, listen, we got so many people in our community who can't afford a suit. They ain't got no money. And unless we're going to buy suits for them, we can't expect to win them because they're not going to come here because they can't dress like us. So he said, let's have a dress down Sabbath. And so that Sabbath, they all dressed in jeans. And the pastor dressed in his suit and preached. Members came up to him and said, Pastor, you can't wear a suit and we wear jeans. He said, Pastor, you put on jeans next time. So next week, they said, we're going to do it again. And he put on jeans and a t-shirt, and he preached in a jeans and t-shirt. And people from the community came to the church because they felt like they could be comfortable there since no one would look at them strange in their jeans and t-shirt. Boy, the church members loved it so much they said, Pastor, let's have dress down Sabbath every Sabbath. Why? Because the tradition should never stand in the way of the people you're trying to win. Did you hear me? Your tradition can never stand in the way of the people you're trying to win. Jesus could have gotten food from somewhere else, but on the Sabbath, he went through the grain field to show them that the Sabbath is not to be a burden on people. The Sabbath is to be a blessing for people. And too often, people get told they're supposed to do this and do that. You got a long list of stuff you're supposed to do on the Sabbath, and people are tired and worn out, and people are made to feel guilt. Listen, the Sabbath, if you aren't refreshed when the Sabbath is done, then you can do all that you want to do. You're still not keeping it. And if the Sabbath is a burden when it is over, 
I remember as a kid, you know, kids all the time, oh, I can't wait till this thing is over. And we think that we're making our kids keep the Sabbath, and yet the Sabbath is not kept properly if it is not a delight. Didn't we say, Isaiah 58, verse 13 and 14, if you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and for some of us, we stop right there as if that's the only part of the command, but God says, and call the Sabbath a delight. If the Sabbath isn't a delight, a joy, then it hasn't been kept, even though you refrain from talking about the sporting event the day before. Jesus was intentionally radical because Jesus was more concerned with people than he was with the traditions of men. Jesus needs his church to be more concerned with people than the traditions of men. Because our traditions could never save us. Our practices can't save us. But there's the last thing Jesus was, and I'm going to close right here. Not only was Jesus unnecessarily compassionate to the mother, Jesus saw her need, saw what she was going through, understood she had just lost her husband. How did he know? Because he noticed that there was no man standing next to her leading the procession. She was a widow. And now she has no son. Jesus took the time to notice what her condition was. He didn't just say, how you doing, and kept moving. Unnecessarily compassionate, intentionally radical, but finally he was decisively triumphant. Because the Bible tells us that Jesus didn't just stop with, with helping the woman feel better by being compassionate toward her. No, the Bible says Jesus touched the coffin. Jesus looked at the dead man and Jesus spoke life into the dead man. Jesus was triumphant in the story. Oh, listen, I wish somebody in here would get excited and understand that Jesus is victorious. Jesus is victorious. Sometimes as Christians, we live a life that is so beat down as if the enemy is the one who has won. But my Bible tells me that Jesus kicked his rear end out of heaven. Jesus came down to earth and kicked his rear end some more. And the Bible tells me that Jesus' church is victorious over the enemy because Jesus is victorious. Oh, I don't have to worry when the enemy is on my back. Why? Because I can say to him, get thee behind me, Satan, just like Jesus did. And I can command the enemy to be gone, to get out, to leave me alone. Why? Because Jesus is victorious. God has a body. And the word of God says that the body has the enemy under it. That means, that means, that means, as Ellen White says so wonderfully, that the weakest saint, the weakest saint, it doesn't require you to have had a relationship with God for 30 years. The weakest saint who comes to the Lord in prayer sends the enemy to the weakest, the newest, the youngest, the one who only has this much faith. Like you victorious. You need to be reminded. You need to remind yourself as one who is victorious, not as one who is defeated. Okay, I want to challenge us to follow the example of Jesus Christ. The example of Jesus is one of compassion. Jesus paid attention to the details. He watched how people are acting and moving. And when someone was hurt, the Bible teaches that Jesus was so sensitive to their needs that Jesus, the, the, the way the Bible describes it, says that a bruised reed he wouldn't break. See? In other words, you're hurting, you're not going to get hurt anymore by Jesus coming around. He's going to make sure that, that he eases it just a little bit. Our presence should ease the hurt just a little bit. God forbid if anybody in here ever is offended by my presence. I hope that when you're around me, you say, well, 
you know, he, he may not have helped a whole lot, but at least he, he didn't hurt me any. He, he tried to encourage just a little bit. Challenge us to follow the example of Jesus. He was not only compassionate, but unnecessarily compassionate. He was kind to folk who he didn't even know. Went out of his way to help those that he didn't even know. Jesus placed people above his own traditions, above the ceremonies. Now, Jesus didn't break the ten. Amen. He didn't break the ten. The ten are commanded, and you break the ten, you have sinned. The ceremonies and traditions are not commands. Put people above the tradition. Because that's the highest value for for heaven. God wants to save people. And Jesus was triumphant. He was victorious. He called us to live a life of victory, not defeat from the enemy. Today, if you want to follow that example of Jesus Christ, stand with me as we're about to close with prayer today. As I say very often, this kind of appeal only works for those who are believers. Because if you're not a believer, then you can't be victorious. You cannot be victorious if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, a follower of him. Because there is no victory if you're only following yourself. I'm not victorious. I can't pray with power unless I'm praying in the name of Jesus. There ain't no power in my name. I have to pray in the name of Jesus. I can't truly be compassionate until I have the heart of Jesus Christ living inside me. Then I can, have, then I can follow that kind of example. So today, someone might not have committed their life to Jesus Christ before. Those standing, you've committed your life, you're following Jesus, and you want to follow the example laid out today, but some might not be committed to following Jesus yet, but today you want to commit your life to following Jesus Christ. Today you want to make a decision to follow Jesus and give him your life. If you've not done that before, but today you want to do so, I invite you to make your way down front at this time. Today someone needs to make a decision to give their life to Jesus Christ, and today is your day. Today is your day. If you need to make that decision, I invite you to come. Rather go, rather be it than have riches. Today, someone needs to make a decision to give their life to Jesus Christ. Than to be the king of a vast domain in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus. Bow your heads with me as we close today. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the example of Jesus Christ. Lord, you are amazing in your love and compassion. Lord, there were times you were exhausted, but you still took the time to care for people because people mattered most to you. Lord, we're amazed by your love and your compassion, your sensitivity. You are observant, Lord. You could tell when someone was down and hurt, Lord. May we have that kind of sensitivity. May what we have to do never take precedence over people in our lives. Lord, may we look out for those that are hurting and, and reach out to give them a hug, encourage the one who is downtrodden, care for the one who is hurting, Lord. May we always place people above even our own traditions and, 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 and practices, Lord. May we never put, put obstacles in the way of people coming to Jesus. And Lord, may we live a life of victory, recognizing that we are victorious in Christ, that we have authority in Christ, that we have healing in Christ, that we have deliverance in Christ, 
We don't have to suffer like the world suffers. We have victory in Christ. We thank you, Lord, for that victory. We thank you, Lord, for your power in our lives, your transformation. May we walk in it. May we live in it. May we minister in it until that day that we see you coming in the clouds of glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. And amen. You may be seated.